Hi, I'm Dr. Kat Fleece from Central New Mexico Community College, continuing with our discussion of the female reproductive system. In this video, video D, we're focusing on oogenesis, that is the development of the oocytes. Development of the female gametes, or better referred to as oogenesis, is best studied by dividing the whole process into three time periods. And that is what happens in the fetus, what happens around puberty, and what happens in the event fertilization occurs. I'm going to use the next slide to expand on these different life phases. If we compare oogenesis in the female to spermatogenesis in the male, there's one big difference. The big difference is that spermatogenesis in a boy begins at puberty when his testosterone levels begin to rise and you learn how that all works. In the female, interestingly enough, oogenesis starts in the fetus. So while we girls are still in our mother's womb, we already begin the process of oogenesis. Therefore, you'll see that this particular chart is divided up into the time period before birth and the time period after birth. Perhaps I should make this line a little bit clearer. And so while we're still in our mother's womb, we eventually grow cells called oogonia, just like the male has spermatogonia. We have oogonia. They are diploid. They are cells that have a full set of chromosomes. They have a set of maternal and a set of paternal chromosomes. So two sets, so therefore they are diploid. These oogonia are going to literally just make more of themselves by means of mitotic divisions, and I'd rather just say mitotic divisions. After all, we are not just dividing the nucleus, which would be called mitosis, but also the cytoplasm by means of cytokinesis. And cytokinesis plus the nuclear division is referred to as a mitotic division. So these two daughter cells we see here they are actually the same thing as the oogonia. They're the daughter cells. They are perfect copies. One of, these OO, one of these daughter cells is going to continue functioning as an oogonium and will continue going through mitotic divisions. But one of them actually will begin the process of meiosis. And so we'll refer to that one as our primary oocyte. So the primary oocyte is formed way before we're born. So meiosis 1 begins, remember, with prophase 1, metaphase 1, etc. But notice that we stop meiosis 1 very early on, we stop in prophase one. So when we're born, when we're born, we are born with primary oocytes arrested in prophase one. So all of those primordial follicles that we have at birth and the ones that we're left with at puberty, those are all primary oocytes that have been stopped at prophase one. Now, when puberty kicks in and the right hormones kick in, the right sex hormones kick in, and we're going to learn about those in just a little bit, particularly follicle stimulating hormone and also luteinizing hormone, we'll see that meiosis begins to continue. And at first, meiosis 1 finishes its division to produce two haploid cells. This is the first time we see haploid cells because meiosis 1 has finished. 
the division, the cytokinesis process, that is the division of the cytoplasm is very uneven, such that we get, we end up with one big cell and one tiny little cell. The little cell we call a polar body, first polar body. And it's not, it typically, it may or may not survive. But the other cell we're going to refer to as the secondary oocyte. So this is going to be the oocyte that is ovulated. So this one will go through the process of ovulation and this is the one that may or may not be penetrated by a sperm cell. Now the secondary oocyte before it can be penetrated by a sperm cell is going to continue with meiosis 2 and then arrest in metaphase 2. So our primary oocyte was arrested in prophase 1. Our secondary oocyte that is ovulated is arrested in metaphase 2. So when we release an egg by means of ovulation, it never finishes meiosis 2. It is stopped halfway meiosis 2, namely in metaphase 2. It will never finish meiosis 2 unless it becomes fertilized by a sperm cell. So only if a secondary oocyte is fertilized by a sperm cell will it finish metaphase 2, and it will go into um, anaphase 2, telophase 2, and also go through cytokinesis 2 to where we create yet another polar body right here. Once again, notice that the division is very uneven, and the cell that we'll refer to as the ovum, which is the cell that has been penetrated by the sperm cell, has once again hogged all the cytoplasm. And this makes sense because this is going to be our future zygote, the moment the nucleus of the sperm cell and the nucleus of our ovum fuse, we have formed a zygote, that cytoplasm will nourish our zygote. This polar body will eventually die off, and in the event this first polar body does persist, and succeeds in finishing its meiosis to, to form second polar bodies, these second polar bodies will die off as well. So if we compare, if we, or I should say there is a second major comparison to make with the males, the first one was that oogenesis begins well before for birth, while in the male it doesn't start till puberty, the second main difference is that a male will produce per spermatogodium four viable sperm cell. Not the case in the female. In the female, we start out with an oogonium and we end up with only one viable gamete. The other three, the other three will die off. The other three we refer to as polar bodies and they have no function. They're not viable. So in summary, when we use the term ovum, we're actually referring to an oocyte, a secondary oocyte that has been penetrated or we could say fertilized by a sperm. This ovum, by the way, is then going to be referred to as a zygote, or I should say it becomes a zygote when a sperm cell comes in and fuses with the ovum's nucleus. So when fusion of both nuclei occurs, we have a zygote, and that is the very first step in our embryo. This wraps up oogenesis.